I'll be giving a brief introduction to the print and picture collection, and then I'll talk about Independence Day and how Philadelphia has celebrated it over the years, including three big anniversaries in 1876, 1926, and 1976. The print and picture collection, which we call PICS for short, is home to a variety of collections of prints, photos, drawings, posters, artist books, and historical images of Philadelphia. PIX has a staff of one curator, that's me, one library assistant, and a handful of dedicated volunteers. We work to create tools to help you find what you're looking for. We select material to add to our digital collections. We answer reference questions and invite researchers by appointment. We host class visits and programs from elementary age to lifelong learners. We work on exhibitions throughout Parkway Central Library. You can find us on social media, visit our website, and email us to get in touch. When we are um, open again, please give us a call and come visit us in Parkway Central Library. So let's talk about Independence Day. Independence Day is the United States annual celebration of nationhood. It commemorates the passage of the Declaration of Independence by the Second Continental Congress on July 4th, 1776 in the Pennsylvania State House located between 5th and 6th Streets on Chestnut Street. This is the earliest known representation of the State House, seen here in 1752, not 1750 like it says, in a reprint of Skull and Heap's famous map of Philadelphia. Over time, the State House became known as Independence Hall. On July 8, 1776, the first public readings of the Declaration of Independence were held in Independence Square to the ringing of bells and band music. The next year, on July 4th, 1777, Congress was adjourned and Independence Day was celebrated with bonfires, bells, and fireworks. These two prints based on paintings by John Lewis Crimmel show celebrations at Center Square, the former site of the city's waterworks and the current site of Philadelphia City Hall. Here's an 1851 July 4th firework display at Broad and Market from a clipping in the Kastner scrapbooks, a 47 volume on set on Philadelphia history. The words above the arches say, July 4th, 1776, Liberty and Union, now and forever, one and inseparable. Celebrating American independence when not all people in America had independence is a reminder of the Declaration's hypocrisy about liberty. When slaves were freed in New York State on July 4th, 1827, African-Americans celebrated the next day, July 5th. In 1832, Peter Osborne addressed the African church in New Haven, Connecticut. On account of the misfortune of our color, our 4th of July comes on the 5th, but I hope and trust that when the Declaration of Independence is fully executed, which declares that all men without respect of person were born free and equal, we may then have our 4th of July on the 4th. When Frederick Douglass, who had escaped slavery in 1838, was asked to speak to the Ladies Anti-Slavery Society of Rochester, New York on Independence Day, 1852, he chose July 5th for the day of his address. The words of his speech, what to the slave is the 4th of July, include the rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. This 4th July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. You can find the full text of the speech in eBooks available through freelibrary.org. By the 1870s, the 4th of July was the most important secular holiday on the calendar. Cong Congress passed a law making Independence Day a federal holiday on June 28, 1870. On March 3rd, 1871, in preparation for the 100th anniversary of the passage of the Declaration of Independence, an act of Congress provided for a World's Fair in Philadelphia in 1876. The International Exhibition of Arts, Manufactures, and Products of the Soil and Mine, or in a less wordy way, the Centennial Exhibition, opened on May 10th, 1876 on a 285 acre tract of Fairmount Park overlooking the Schuylkill River. The fairgrounds were designed almost exclusively by 27 year old German immigrant Hermann J. Schwartzman. This balloon view is a hand colored wood engraving for Harper's Weekly, 
If you visit the Centennial Exhibition Digital Collection at freelibrary.org slash digital, you can really zoom in on the image and see the labels for each building and street name. The grounds included Memorial Hall, which was designed as a permanent monument to the Centennial. The building is now the home of the Please Touch Museum and the main exhibition building where 13,720 exhibitors from over 27 countries displayed their manufacturers like furniture, clocks, and tools. The opening ceremonies took place on the terraces of Memorial Hall and in the area facing the main building. Speaker stands were erected in front of Memorial Hall and stands for a great choir and orchestra were placed directly opposite before the entrance of the main building. President Ulysses S. Grant and other dignitaries spoke to the crowds of over 150,000 people. Frederick Douglass was invited to sit with the president, but was not invited to speak. In fact, he was almost denied entrance to the platform by police who refused to honor his ticket, incredulous that a black man would be welcome in the company of the president. After a senator intervened, he reached the platform and was loudly cheered. This is one of over 1,100 photographs in our collection by the Centennial Photographic Company, which held the sole license for photography issued by the Centennial Commission. The photos range in size. This one is 13 inches by 16 inches. All of the CPC photographs are silver albumin prints created on site in a complex and cumbersome process that required lots of supplies, equipment, equipment and manpower. It's hard to see the details in this virtual presentation but if you spend some time looking at the digital collection, you'll be surprised what you can find when you zoom in. Take a look at these four spots. It's hard to make out what's going on at this size. But when you zoom in, you can see a conductor and others on top of a full trolley car, the platform, which probably holds President Grant and Frederick Douglass, a spectator standing on top of a road roller for a better view, and the Centennial Photographic Company set up to take a different photo. During the Centennial Exhibition, the 100th anniversary of the passage of the Declaration of Independence was celebrated at Independence Hall with ceremonies featuring a reading of the document by a descendant of an original signer. This wasn't the only declaration read that day. The National Women's Suffrage Association, having been denied permission to be part of the official Centennial Ceremony, printed and distributed copies of their Declaration of Rights for Women. When leader Susan B. Anthony spotted an unoccupied bandstand, she stepped up and read the declaration to a large crowd. We protest before the assembled nations of the world against the centennial ce celebration as an occasion for national rejoicing, as only through equal impartial suffrage can a genuine Republican form of government be realized. Here are some centennial highlights. The Corliss Centennial Steam Engine in Machinery Hall provided power to exhibitors throughout the exhibition because George Corliss would not allow his engines to be operated on Sundays. The Centennial was only open six days a week. The arm and hand of Bartholdi's Liberty Enlightening the World arrived at the Centennial in August. Visitors could climb up to the balcony of the torch to view the fairground. Ten years later, the completed Statue of Liberty was dedicated in New York Harbor. Admission to the Centennial was 50 cents. The largest single day attendance was Pennsylvania Day on Thursday, September 28th. This photo shows the crowd in front of the Pennsylvania building on that day. In the six months before opening day, May 10th, and closing day, November 10th, nearly 10 million people visited to help celebrate the United States Centennial. Now we'll fast forward 50 years to the Ses Sesquicentennial International Exposition of 1926. Hicks has almost 3,000 items related to the celebration of 150 years of American independence, including two dozen volumes of photographs by John Cardinal, the official photographer of the exposition. Only about 300 of the items are scanned, which means I'm not able to virtually give you a full picture of the event. So I'll just share a few images from our digital collection. The idea for a sesquicentennial was suggested by Philadelphia businessman John Wanamaker in 1916. Wanamaker served on the Centennial Board of Finance and hoped the city would host another World's Fair on the site of the new Fairmount Parkway, now Benjamin Franklin Parkway. 
1924, with corruption rampant in the city, the newly elected mayor, Freeland Kendrick, in an act of political patronage, changed the location to a swampy area of South Philadelphia known as the Neck. The lack of planning time and poor building conditions did not bode well for the success of the fair. Here are two images showing the fairgrounds just one year before the exposition was to start. And in the next pictures we can see one year later, the unfinished roads and buildings that were just, um, that still weren't finished before opening day. Straddling Broad Street, just above the fair's entrance on Packer Avenue was an 80 foot high replica of the Liberty Bell with 26,000 15 watt light bulbs. The vertical road in the center of this map is Broad Street. At the bottom is the giant Liberty Bell. At the top is the Navy Yard. That horseshoe design in the upper left was Sesquicentennial Stadium, later known as JFK Stadium. As part of the Sesquicentennial, Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney fought the, bo the Boxing World's Heavyweight Championship in front of a crowd of over 120,000 people. We have two dozen vendor booth photos scanned showing Wilbur Chocolates, Hires Root Beer, several near beer vendors and more. The near beer vendors are a reminder that the sesquicentennial took place during prohibition. This photo, photo of the Briars ice cream booth is one of my favorites. The delicious nutritious ice cream sandwiches were only 10 cents. We'll leave the sesquicentennial behind with a bang. Here are fireworks over the lagoon. And we'll fast forward again to the United States Bicentennial of 1976. I used to think that this Dixie cup and a few folders of material were all we had related to the 1976 Bicentennial celebrations, but we recently unearthed a 12 volume set of Bicentennial scrapbooks seen here on this cart. The scrapbooks were created by Sidney W. Hay, who donated the volumes to the library in 1977 Mr. Hay spent 14 months compiling the material from three of Philadelphia's daily newspapers, the Bulletin, Inquirer, and Daily News, and the material fills nearly 3,000 pages. Since we only recently rediscovered the scrapbooks, none of them have been digitized, so we just have iPhone snapshots. On the left is the cover of volume one, on the right, an open page spread. Since Mr. Hay only started the scrapbooks in late 1975, they don't show the full picture of the drama behind planning a bicentennial. They only capture the events of the bicentennial year, 1976. This 1964 booklet from the City Planning Commission shows plans for aerial cable cars from Convention Hall to the Art Museum to the zoo to the planned exhibition grounds in Fairmount Park. A group of young professionals proposing a much larger bicentennial plan conflicted with the City Planning Commission. Another initiative wanted to make sure minority voices were included in the planning. Without support and funding from the federal government, bicentennial plans in Philadelphia were scaled down and smaller celebrations of the bicentennial were held throughout the United States. The American Way Festival took place on May 11, 1975 to coincide with the 200th anniversary of the convening of the Second Continental Congress and to serve as an opening event for the upcoming bicentennial. The, feature, the festival featured music, dance, sports, arts and crafts, parades, fireworks, and more. And the headline act was Blood, Sweat, and Tears. The first pages of Mr. Hayes' scrapbook, of Mr. Hayes' scrapbook start with the plan to ring in the year 1976 with a physical move of the Liberty Bell from Independence Hall to the new Liberty Bell Pavilion. The bell was moved again to the Liberty Bell Center in 2003. A lot of clippings in the scrapbooks include negative opinions on the bicentennial planning and the commercialism surrounding it. The caption for this Tony Auth cartoon from the Inquirer says, in what other country are the people free enough to do this to their bicentennial? Items for sale in the shop include a flag themed toilet seat, spirits of 76, and a special patriotic White House tape deck. Leading up to the bicentennial, Mayor Frank Rizzo, having increased taxes just after being elected in 1975, was facing a recall by opponents. At the same time, Rizzo told the press that if federal and state authorities didn't send 15,000 troops to maintain order during the bicentennial celebration, the quote, blood is on their hands. 
Who were these radicals that worried Rizzo? One group was called Rich Off Our Backs. The Rich Off Our Backs Coalition, whose slogan was, we've carried the rich for 200 years, let's get them off our backs, did demonstrate during the Bicentennial while all demonstrations were peaceful. But Rizzo's hysterical warning of bloodshed kept many visitors from visiting Philadelphia. Celebrities and dignitaries did honor Philadelphia's ro role in the Bicentennial throughout 1976. Princess Grace was a judge in the flower show. Elton John played three nights at the Spectrum and Frank Rizzo declared July 7th to be Elton John Day in Philadelphia. Hank Aaron and President Gerald Ford watched the Major League Baseball All-Star Game at Veterans Stadium. Reverend Jesse Jackson gave a sermon on Independence Mall as part of an interfaith group service on Independence Day. Many public works of art were installed in honor of the Bicentennial, including Robert Indiana's love statue and Jacques Lipschitz's Government of the People. Shown here are Klaus Oldenburg's clothespin at Center Square, John W. Roden's Nasaika at the newly opened African American Museum at 7th and Arch, and a colorful orange banner designed by Alexander Calder. The banner is one of the Calder banners that now belong to the Free Library. We'll wrap up our tour of Philadelphia celebrations in the print and, print and picture collection here. Something to keep in mind is that the 250th anniversary of the passage of the Declaration of Independence in 2026 is just six years away. An organization called Philadelphia 250 is already underway coordinating efforts to commemorate the anniversary. Maybe they can draw inspiration and learn lessons from our previous exhibit, uh, previous celebrations. <laughs>